to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We're coming to you today from Cocoa Beach, Florida. And I got to tell you what, this morning, it was so cool because I do a, a morning ocean sunrise catechism class. Wherever I am in the world, bear time. So around 7 a.m. bear time, or if I sleep in and can't get to it. But around that time, we do a 15-minute ocean sunrise catechism. And we're reading all the way through the catechism and kind of, uh, you know, talking about it as we go in the, in the kind of the bear style. And uh, we're almost through it. We're, by the end of this year, we'll have gone through the whole catechism once, and then we're going to start over. And uh, uh, after we, the new, the new phase that we're going to go through, we're going to have Monday through Thursday is the new catechism, and the Fridays we'll do the Baltimore catechism. So it's going to be cool. But this morning, something really awesome happened. My condo here in Cocoa Beach looks uh, out over the ocean, and then to the north, it's the Kennedy Space Center. And I, I turned on Ocean Sunrise Catechism at 6.59 and listening to the countdown for a launch uh, at 7 a.m. And, you know, it's so cool because you can listen to the countdown on your iPhone and they'll be going, uh, uh, electronics, go. Um, uh, fuel, go. Uh, radio, go. Down range, go. And then the, and then the, uh, and then the, the, the guy will ask to the controller permission to launch, and he'll say permission to launch given. And then it goes from the two-minute countdown all the way down. Then it goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. We have liftoff. Think about the power of a, a nuclear power. You know, think about what fission is. Fission, nuclear fission is this incredible power that releases so much energy. Think, uh, and what it does, it releases energy from the smallest thing we have, an atom. Think about what would happen if Jesus at the cross, when his soul and his body were separated, never separated from, from, his, from God, but separated from each other. Because in, in Jesus Christ, you have someone who is all God and all man. So always uh, the, the God part of him connected to his body, always connected to his soul. But the, his, his human soul and body were separated. Think about the nuclear fission, the atomic power, the cosmic power of forgiveness uh, that was released into the world at that moment. And then there's nuclear fusion, which I think is almost almost as maybe more powerful, I think, than nuclear fission. That's when you fuse the smallest elements in the universe together and great power is unleashed. That's what happened at Jesus' resurrection when the greatest being in all of the universe, he's not even in the universe, he made the universe, uh, is his soul and body returned on Easter morning. Think about the great explosive power that happened then for our, so that we could live in redeemed and in resurrection power and glory, even as the early church fathers say that someday being part of the body of Christ, we would be divinized, become like God. Well, think about this. When Jesus was uh, on the cross, you know, uh, Satan just came after him with everything he had. You know, Satan's weapon is, ultimate weapon is death. And I love to fight. You know, I'm a second-degree ninja black belt. I love to knife fight, especially it's kind of funny when you're training and someone's attacking you with a knife because when they're attacking you with a knife, you know where their attack is going to come from. And you can use their energy and their power and take that knife and slay them with their own knife. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He took captivity captive. He destroyed death. But there was this great song uh, by a, a rock musician named Ka uh, Carmen, a, a Christian rocker named Carmen, called The Champion. And in it, there's this, this battle of the ages taking on, Satan against the Son of God in the middle of a boxing ring. And they're fighting it out and fighting it out. You know, you can see Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, fighting it out, Jesus casting out demons, healing the sick, healing uh, uh, wounded souls, reconciling, bringing forgiveness. And they're just duking it out. And then finally you see Jesus just drop his guard and Satan wails on him and knocks him out. This is the, the image of the cross. And the demons are squealing with glee. We've destroyed him. And then God the Father 
starts the countdown. You know how you do it. One, two, you can see the referee. Three, four, and at the count of ten, the boxing match is over. But something really unusual happened. Instead of saying, counting it, one, two, three, God the Father said, ten, nine, eight, seven. And for all history in the fullness of time, six, five, four, three, two, one. And all the saints, all the demons said, oh, no. And all the saints said, oh, yes. And the power and the rec- resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, you know, we look at these launching of these rockets here at the Kennedy Space Center, and we, we're just so, thr- so thrilled by the power of that. St. Paul's favorite word wasn't Jesus, wasn't Christ, or wasn't love. It was power. We need power in our lives. And we know as Catholics, the source and summit of our faith is in the sacraments, and the ultimate is, of course, the Eucharist. Avail yourself to the sacrament of reconciliation and, and, to be few, you know, and, and avail yourself to the sacrament of the Eucharist and be empowered to live the powerful Christian life, the personal relationship that he has for you. So we have with us today uh, someone who I really like. I've been watching his YouTubes, and I've heard his name because it seems like we might be almost related. I think he's probably Polish and I'm Ukrainian. Tim Glemkowski, brother. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak adventure. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Don't you love that countdown? You know, like, oh, no, he's counting backwards. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that one before. I like that a lot. Dude, anybody who hasn't watched it needs to, needs to check it out on YouTube. Carmen, the champion. It just, it just man, you, you will play it in front of all the confirmation classes you probably work with. So, so Tim, Tim, Tim Glomkowski, he is, he, he's a graduate of Steubenville University, theology and philosophy, which I, yep. I, I just love that. And then you have your, your ministry at Lalto, Catholic Institute, where you help um, not-for-profits or, or churches, right, um, in um, developing their, more of their church mission. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about that? But I want to dig into some other areas, too. But So what is the focus of your ministry, Tim? Yeah, so while I was, uh, I was teaching high school theology and um, was getting my master's at the Augustine Institute out of, out of Denver and really started to have a heart for it, there's a real emphasis and focus on the new evangelization there. And um, the, the thought just it just kept occurring to me that there was this new evangelization. John Paul II is kind of one of my heroes that he called yeah. for uh, in so many ways, like a lot of the parishes that I had experienced. I saw it happening in movements. There are all these great apostolates and organizations and uh, media movements, you know, like yours that right. were doing kind of great new evangelization type work. But a lot of it hadn't permeated normal parish life. So I just wanted to work with parishes to help them become more effective at uh, disciples. So. Uh, that's what we've been doing for the last three years. It's been a, an exciting ride. We really, we really need that. And you know what else we need? We need men to step into the fray. You know, men. Sure. From, yeah, we need men. I'll say, well, the women have kind of taken over the church. Well, no, it's your fault. You know, you didn't join the parish council. Why don't you join uh, and teach catechism, teach RCIA, teach confirmation, lead a youth group, start a men's group. Men need to. We need, We really, really need our men to come up to the front line and not be sitting in the background anymore. Yeah, that temptation to passivity, right, is so real. Uh, it takes a lot of confidence to kind of st- have to step out. And, you know, to do our to do our ministry, we had, this is this is my full-time work now, and it's had to be a work of trust in the Lord. And there's all those voices that want you to sit, like kind of just stay back and don't push too hard and don't uh, try to do something big for God. But um, it's been a, a good learning process just seeing, I mean, God takes care of it, right? Like, um, he watches out for us. Well, you know, when you we always say at a Deep Adventure Ministries, the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. There's no other place I'd rather be than in the middle of God's will because it's like having, I wouldn't say front row seats. <laughs> That's not the right word. Or 50-yard line seats because you're in the fray. But you get to see God move. Because when you're moving in his will, there's these mountains in front of you and all of a sudden, poof. You know, you're about to run into a brick wall and it just kind of crumbles as you move in God's will. It's not, you know, it's not like you're doing him any favors. This is his will. And you're just saying, well, can I walk in your will? Wouldn't it be cool if I could do that? Yeah, I love that image of God. Like we have such a a, a safe image of God sometimes. Like he just wants us to be, you know, like, um, like piety is holiness, right? Piety is important, but 
uh, I, I think in a particular way to my own heart, that that call for wildness kind of speaks to me. Like we live here in Denver, Colorado, right? So I've heard of it. Are, are I've heard right of here. Denver. I've heard of it. Yeah. One or two. Yeah. Uh, and we, I mean, we just love it. Like that's why we're here is the mountains and the adventure. And like I go with a, a buddy every other Friday at dawn, we go and, and just do a, even when it's like snowing. And it, it, it's funny, like when the, the worse the conditions are, the more fun it is. Right. Or doing yeah, a 14. Why, like, why is that? Why yeah, do, exactly. Like we're doing a long motorcycle ride afterwards. We're going. During the middle of it, you're like, oh, this is hard. And then afterwards, let's do it again. Yeah. It's so sanitized sometimes our life, right? Like, so yeah. like, it's kind of polite and, and, uh, it's kind of fun to be able to push yourself and I don't know, do dumb stuff even like, um, you know, a couple of times getting out of parking lots after hikes, like we're skidding down the road. Like, I hope I don't just go right in, you know, but it, that's, that's the, Cause that's it's kind of the conditions, right? Yeah. 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 I, I've heard, I read one, one place, our, our, the priest who did our, um, like marriage prep, I remember him saying, I don't know theologically if this is, it, it was a good reflection for me though. There's this idea in Genesis that Adam is not actually born in the garden because the garden is order and security. But Adam, it says God makes Adam and then places him in the garden. So like Adam is actually made in the wilderness and he's always made for the wilderness, like to both tame it, but then also to experience it. And he's so. made out of the wilderness. He's made out of the dirt, you know? Yeah. The woman comes from his side, more of kind of a, uh, a, uh, a distilled version of what a ma what mankind can be, but the man himself is just pretty rough. We're talking with Tim Glemkowski. We're gonna get, really have some fun in this in this next in this next uh, part of our show. Get a little bit, find out a little bit more about Tim. But if they want to find you, Tim, what's your website? LaltoCatholic.com. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to please go to our YouTube channel if you want to see what Tim looks like. It's not that great, but if you want to see what he looks like, you can go to the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel and subscribe. And then guess what? You get to see uh, see the YouTube version of this show. Uh, or, so a uh, Bear Wozniak YouTube channel. Go there and subscribe. And it, whenever we, we post a new show, you get to watch it. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We want to invite you... Um, to go to our website, deepadventure.com. We, it's a new website, and our web designer had such a challenge because he goes, man, you got so much going on. How do I make it so that people can find their way through? There's just so much. You've got the Bear Wozniak Unchained videos. You've got the, Bear, the Ocean Sunrise Catholic Catechism videos. You've got uh, the, the, the Bear Wozniak, what is it called? My radio show, <laughs> the Bear Wozniak on YouTube, the Bear Wozniak Adventure on YouTube. We've got... We've got, and of course, a lot of tandem surfing videos, too, because I'm a, you probably know I'm a world champion tandem surfer. So we got so, so much going on there. So go to our website, deepadventure.com. But I got to tell you, the coolest thing we got going on is Long Ride Home. Uh, season two is airing on EWTN right now. I think EWTN ran that 10 episode series of season one about 20 times. And the Armed Forces Network just keeps rerunning and rerunning it. But here's the thing. If you go to our website and you become a Patreon donor, I think it's at a $20 level, then you get to have all, we'll send you all 10 episodes of season one, plus all six episodes of season two uh, before it even airs. And then as right now we're editing season three, every time the director's cut is finished, you will get that episode released to you a year before it comes out on EWTN. Plus you get shows like this, the, uh, the Bear Wozniak Adventure, you get this about a month or so before it even airs too. So Go to our website, deepadventure.com, and join the pack. Help us out. Uh, become, become a member of the pack. So we're talking with Tim Glimbowski. So uh, Tim's, Tim's ministry is uh, to, to help uh, churches renew their, their, their mission, but also uh, he's an evangelist. And I, I see that and love him in that. But, but um, evangelists tend to have been people who kind of stepped out of the box. And you were talking about how you like to go up in the mountains around Denver and sometimes even in the winter. But I, I've, I've heard a rumor that you, uh, you have this problem with jumping off of rocks or cliffs or, or <laughs> stuff like is that. Do you do that on purpose? You know, yeah, we used to a little bit more. I, uh, I have two young kids now, so I try to. But for, for a while there, especially in college, me and my group of friends, that's kind of one of our, our favorite pastimes was to go find high rocks to jump off of. Into, well, are they still uh, all alive? I mean, did you lose any of them in the process? You know, almost, but we did make it. There's some great near miss stories, you know. Uh, but but yeah, we're all we're all still alive and kicking, which is good. So you're saying going to college in Steubenville it, it drives you 
to the edge so much that you just want to jump off a cliff. That's it. There's not a lot to do in the Ohio Valley. Yeah. But there was there was this great little um, like up the Ohio River a little bit. There was this creek that would kind of lead down. And I shouldn't even tell anybody this in case some of the students, you know, are tempted to go find it. But um, they had this great like kind of varying levels of, you know, 10 foot, 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot jumps down into the water. But the 40 foot one, it was a little crazy because uh, it had this um, it was kind of into like almost like just like nine feet. So you, you jump real far. And I mean, you were you were like falling for a bit, uh, but then you had to splay out real fast so that you didn't hit the bottom. After, and so after you hit the water, you had to splay out. Right. Because it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah you don't want to kill like you yourself. Hitting it. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And we had a buddy, Steve, uh, Steve Digman, who was six, five, 300. Oh, like just no. This big guy. Hey, Steve, and if he, you're listening. Yeah, he's, he's the we're man. making you famous. So 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 he jumped in there. That can be. He, yeah. And uh, he did it and he made it. I mean, he, he definitely he came up and he was like, I definitely got a foot into the mud, but um, he made it back up. But we used to do the Hail Mary before we would jump it, you know, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And then just go. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that stuff that, that, that to me always just that, that's what I loved about Steubenville is I had a, a really great group of brothers there. With, they, everyone lives in households. They're called right like Christian fraternities almost. And my group is just a lot of like good, normal guys that like uh, I think for me really inspired me with their that, like they were running after Christ, but they were also. Uh, full of life and adventure. Yeah. Well, and and I always thought those things were mutually yeah. exclusive. No, yeah, they go together, right? Well, how about when you were studying in, in Italy? Did you get any cliff? Oh, yeah, or... yeah. Yeah, these are some of the stories that I like to tell. Yeah, we uh, we, we used to love, like, um, I don't know if you've heard Cinque Terre, Italy. It's like the, the five lands, it's called. It's You kind of take a train there, and it's along the, the coast. And um, Are you going north they're, they're... or south from Rome? It would mean like north from Rome, I think. Okay. Um, I'm not my Italian geography. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so beautiful, like paradise. You know, you're hiking through orange grove fields and stuff. And we, we would try to sneak down to find like private beaches and then swim out to, to ocean rocks. I know where you are. Yeah. Do you know what I'm kind of talking yeah, about? But yeah. As you, as you would go out, you would hit, um, like you had to kind of hop from rock to rock to make it there because, you know, none of us were strong enough swimmers to just kind of make it all the way out. But the rocks were covered with like mussels or shells or something. Ooh, so yeah. As you climb out, I remember we got to like the final rock and we we get there and I looked at my buddy Elliot and, and I'm looking and all of a sudden, like all these little slices just started bleeding at the same time. <laughs> blood going all the way down. And and I was like and, and then and then we'd go to daily mass after that. You yeah, know but what that's I mean? not like, good, dude. Bleeding in the ocean isn't always a good idea. It kind of attracts now with sharks around, the man right? in the yeah. gray suit, right? Yeah, yeah we used to yeah, surf a sure. spot in uh called uh, steamers lane in santa cruz man and it was gnarly with it would be the the seaweed would cling to it and then there'd be the the mussels on it and then there would be sea uh, uh elephant seals the size of a bull yeah and i remember surfing a contest and dropping in with my tandem partner and this the, you know we were paddling out and someone else uh, us someone else was dropping in and the woman just started freaking out and this this uh elephant seal went up on their board and then slid off Basically took over the lineup. It was the end of the contest for about an hour or so. So being out there, but you know, the, the thing about the cliff diving, there's that thrill. It's like when you skydive, you don't really feel that thrill of, of the of your stomach coming up into your throat because it's more oh, of an elliptical fall, right? You're not dropping, you're kind of soaring in the direction of the plane as you gradually fall. But when you just jump off a high board, you feel that 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 rush, yeah. that like there's something your body's saying, something isn't right here, you know? Yeah. And so 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 tell me then. Did your fraternity of brothers ever uh, say, uh, uh, what is it, Frater Memento More? Yeah, that was one of the things that it kind of, um, I remember thinking about those those moments, um, you know, even thinking back about conversion and just like why the faith for me at some point, the light bulb would come on. But the, the, when, the, where we were staying in Austria, was it was an old Carthusian monastery that I think over the years had the Habsburgs had once once owned it, but maybe the monks were gone by this point. Like I think World War II, there had been, it had been occupied by different people. So at some point, Steubenville bought this old monastery and now sends no. study abroad semesters there, uh, like back in the 80s. And, and wow. since then, people have been going. It's just amazing. Like so, you live literally the, the Maria Throne Chapel, and it's right along the creek, in, like in the you know the the mountains there. And, and all, I mean, just it, it, the Austrian Alps. It's incredible. But the the monks, they would tell us like that was their you know, they were, they were silent and they would live their lives in total silence. But, um, when they would pass each other in the halls, the one thing that they were allowed to say to one another is they would stop, look at each other and say, frater, 
memento mori, which means in Latin, right, brother, remember your death. So this and is the only thing they're allowed to say to each other. That's it. Like, and I think that is, to me, um, you know, we spend so much of our lives trying to like push death away. It's such a negative thought, bad thought. We don't want, you know, it's a, it's a buzzkill, right? To think about, we just want to live, you know? But I think in, in reality, like living actually starts with thinking about the fact that like someday I'm going to die. And so like, what am I going to do if this is one precious life that I have one moment? I don't know how many moments I have. Like, what am I going to do with that? How am I going to live a life of meaning and purpose? And uh, those, those things always connected for me, that feeling of jumping off now and it's the hour of our death, amen, into some water yeah. and brother, remember your death. And I, I just, I just think there's a, a way that adventure begins when we start to reflect on the fact that our time is finite. Well, you know what, man, right now there's someone who may be actually dying listening to this. There's millions of people listening and there's probably several that are going to die today. They may even be our age. It may be younger uh, your age, even younger than me, uh, we never know when that hour is going to come, and we have to yeah. be prepared. You know, the, the Roman generals, when they would come into uh, Rome, you probably know this, when they came, came into Rome, after a, they would have what they called a triumph. They would get to walk through Rome, and everyone would cheer for them. They were supposed to leave their armies on the other side of the Rubicon, right? Except one of them didn't, but, but the Rubicon River. But they would come in, and they would sure. be shouting and screaming, you're so awesome, you won this great victory, you're, you're the man. But there was a slave that would walk about eight steps behind him, and the slave would be saying, memento mori, remember your death. You know, victory is fleeting. That's I cool. When I won the world title, my first world title, it was like really a great feeling, and it lasted about an hour. And then it was sure. like, you know, the, 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 the stands were taken down. Everybody left the beach. And it was like, is that all there is you know, to that? I pursued yeah. that so hard for so many for decades, you know. Um, so, so uh, the the monks of the desert did this too in North Africa, right? Memento mori. Yeah. And I always have worn a skull ring. I don't have it on right now, but because that's they would all have a skull. In, they may not. They may only have some psalms and a gospel in their in their caves, but they all had almost all of them had a human skull to help them remember, live like you're gonna die. Yeah. You can't take it with you. Yeah. Like I, I think even was it the actor Jim Carrey who you know can be controversial, but, um, he said, he, I, I, I wish everybody would achieve like the kind of fame and, and fortune and success that they're seeking after so that they realize it's not the answer. Like so many people spend their whole lives just trying, trying to get to the point that you're describing where it's like, this is the pinnacle, everything I've been seeking after, this is it. And I'm still empty. Like there has to be more than this. You know, exactly. if I find within myself a desire that this world can't satisfy, I, it means I wasn't made for this world. Okay. So let's, let's cut, we're going to talk with Tim Globowski and we're going to throw out some some big names like Aristotle. We're going to talk about this concept of happiness. What makes man happy? What makes your what gives your life meaning? What were you made for by your Creator? Uh, we're going to just uh, explore that a little bit with Tim when we come back. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Tim, where can they find you again? Uh, LaltoCatholic.com. And that's spelled how? L a l t o Catholic.com. Dot com. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Hey, wake up, everybody. Uh, this is Bear Wozniak. I'm giving you a warning uh, that you probably want to turn the dial right now, watch, listen to something else, because we're going to be talking with Tim Glombowski. He's, he's uh, totally so serious and rather dull <laughs> and uh, kind of, I guess you'd say, intellectual. Yeah, and, sorry. Uh, yeah. But, no, we, we, you know, we tried to get someone that would be really, really exciting for the show. We searched everywhere, and so finally we couldn't find anybody, so we invited Tim. Hey, Tim, welcome back to the show. So happy to be here, Bear. I really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Hey, dude, uh, uh, so talking about, uh, you know, at the end, you know, winning a world title or whatever, or, you know, jumping off this cliff or getting your master's degree or accomplish, accomplishing so much, what is, what is the key to finding uh, happiness and meaning? Well, first of all, should, is it, is it a, a vain pursuit to even seek happiness? Is that like kind of a selfish thing? Yeah, I think I mean, it, I think it depends on what we mean by the word, right? Like it, it might seem that way. It seems like a lot of people in our culture like are obsessed with this idea of happiness. And there's probably a way you could pursue it that would seem selfish, but like if you define what happiness actually is wrong. But this is like Aquinas, Aristotle, all these great theologians and philosophers actually said that like the, the desire for happiness, for total fulfillment and peace and joy and like the, the completion of all of our desires is just natural to us as humans. Like it's, it's almost um, 
it's not a, a moral good or, or bad. It's just kind of is. That's how we we operate and function is we seem to be seeking after this final lasting happiness. And so what they would say is, and what I think they're right, and for me, this was very like compelling, you know, at some point, some of my conversion kind of hinged on this realization that it's, it's really only a life of virtue and a life of seeking after God that provides that that utter lasting fulfillment of all desire that we're, we're seeking after. So if we recognize that and we realize that, then the pursuit of happiness actually becomes not selfish, but something that the Lord has put in our hearts, like that we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, Jesus uh, talked about the Beatitudes, you know, what would make you happy. Okay, so then backtrack. Tell us about this moment, this this season of conversion in your life, your initial conversion. Yeah, so I grew up outside suburbs of Chicago, very classically kind of culturally Catholic family. Probably a lot of listeners, you know, get that experience of both. My, my dad was Polish Catholic. My mom was Irish Catholic, but I didn't really know uh, so much why we were uh, Catholic and definitely didn't. Um, love it. You know, I, mass was a boring thing to me. Um, and I, I was tempted by other, other things seemed more exciting. I think the core problem for me was this feeling that in order to live a life of joy and meaning and adventure, I had to be like, uh, I couldn't do the Catholic thing and do that. What, what the Catholic thing was about was repression and boredom and, and, and not not adventure, which has always been a, a kind of a deep desire of mine. So in high school, definitely kind of had my big falling away time where I just partied a lot, played a lot of football, you know, and, and that was kind of my 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 life. And um, was sent by my parents, forced to go to a studentville conference. And over the course, really, of the, that's so cool of them. Wow. I know my mom. I mean, literally, I was probably. I don't think I was kicking and screaming because I would have been too embarrassed to do that. But I was pretty resentful. I think I just the whole bus ride up. I'm. You know, annoyed that I'm there. What am I doing here? And everybody, like, I'm, I don't get along with these people. I'm not like these people at all, right? But that that weekend, the, the speakers and their their challenge to like really encounter who God is and to know Him, and then in adoration to to have a chance to come face to face with Jesus, like it just dawned on me, like for the first time, like, oh my gosh, this is real. Like God is not just some idea or some fairy tale, but like this all, it just a moment of faith and clarity. And it, it struck me and it really challenged me. Like I, I was made very, I was very, there was a joy and a peace in that realization, but also a challenge and a, and a discomfort. So it took me about a year, honestly, getting home. I, I was like set, I'm going to come home from this conference. I'm just going to follow Jesus my whole life. Two weeks later, I'm just, you know, partying again. Right. It took me about a year to realize like the, the the deep emptiness that was that was in my heart because of the kind of life I was living and how it was just leading me to someone I didn't want to be. And um, just in a moment of clarity again, woke up uh, June 7th or June 2nd, 2007. I like still remember the day and my parish had confessions every day. And I remember knowing that and I woke up and I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, that's it. Like, I can't live this way anymore. This is just this is, I'm wasting my time. This is just stupid. And uh, went to confession, gave my life to God. Well, wait, what happened like at confession? Sister. What happened at confession? Well, so we had these great parish well, priests. Can we, hear your, my... can we hear your sins or no? <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, so I think too, like, right, like, I think I'm going to blow these guys away. Like, they've never heard sins as bad as mine. You know, like, I'm just this, like, rebel without a cause. And they, you know, and I get there and say all my sins and they've heard it all before. Right. So I'm thinking that they're going to be scandalized. And they're going to recognize my voice, you know, whatever. Cause we, we knew the priest and all this stuff. And all they said is I absolve you of your sins. Name the father. You know what I mean? Like they, they've heard it all. And, and, and like the, the, the whole point of confession is that we like without sin, there wouldn't be confession. Like we think in some way, I don't know. We have these weird distorted Why notions. Why would God provide for confession if you didn't need it? <laughs> this is what I mean. Like it's just, needs- we're so, well, what does so it feel like when you, when you, when you, when, like, here's someone listening that said, I haven't been in confession in 10 years, right. 15 years, 20 years. I always say going to confession is like skydiving. You really get nervous. And the more, when they start strapping that suit on you, like, like the parachute on you before you, <laughs> like getting in line, you know, for confession. And then all of a sudden the door opens, like the plane of the door plane opens and then the confession opens and you're going, now you're going in and it's like, there's no return. It's, there's, there's a great apprehension. Did you have an apprehension leading up to it? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, I'm like mortified thinking of the things I'm about to tell this, you know, this guy. And then there's that realization of like, this isn't about telling him. It's about me getting right with God. And and Jesus set up this whole structure in John chapter 20, you know, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. He says that to his apostles. Right. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it. It's almost like it's like jumping off of the the cliff cliff, into the waters. At some point, you just have to like, like swallow hard and go. and, And it's always that feeling of coming up out of the water after and you're like, 
let's go. Like that was, you know what I mean? I, there's no, there's no feeling quite like the peace of a really good confession, you know, even to this day, yeah. right? Like, cause it's more than just, it's more than you going to a counselor and telling him all your problems and all your sins. There's grace. There. There's, there's really, no absolution. Yeah. There's no, yeah. Right. It's a sacramental grace. It's not just uh, right. you know, it's the presence of God, right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so, so. Can you, are you still going to tell us your sins or not? No, I'm just yeah, kidding. I mean, you know, only for Patreon supporters. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're going to do an extended version of this radio show then. And we'll, if you want to hear my uh, sins. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for you Patreon supporters. So, uh, okay, so yeah, but that I've heard so many people talk about how it was at confession. This was the moment when they felt that great relief and love of God and yep. the door opened in their heart. So there's yeah. people, what would you say to the people, right? The, the guy, the women right now that are so struggling in sin. And the fact, they're still trapped in it. Yeah. They're not even sure they want to get rid of it at this point. What yeah. would you say to them about the sacrament of confession? I would say like, give God a chance, you know, like let him bet on him. Right. Like take a take a risk for God that God can actually show you something different and a new way. Like I think so. So often we stay rooted where we're at because we're just not sure of what's ahead. And I think sometimes Christianity, Catholicism is proved in the actual living of it. You know, like it has to be almost experienced from the inside for you Amen. to say, like, how good it is. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, it's like you can look at it from the outside for a long time and be like, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Like. It just kind of vacillate in and out. But until you really dive in and then you'll look back six months later and be like, oh, dang, like this is this is it. Like uh, I've never been so peaceful. I've never been so happy. And that's not to say there's not trials. I mean, you and I know, right? There's like, lots we, of them. Praise God. Right? Maybe more. You yeah. Know, but also more joy. Also more peace. Um, well, you so, know, I like what G.K. Chesterton said. You remember what he said about the, the, the walls of orthodoxy? Well, no. And tell me. He said, well, he said it's uh the walls of, of, of orthodoxy are there so that within those walls, good things can run wild. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know that way. I, I, I'm not saying it quite right, probably. You know, and he said, that, he said the, Catholic, like, the Catholic Church is the only thing that looks is bigger from the inside than it looks like from the outside. So yeah. much liberty and freedom in there. Yeah. Yeah, there's like this narrow door that you enter in and then you realize that you've opened up into this incredible expanse. And I mean, that's that's been my life. Like, I have to be honest, God's plans were bigger than mine and they were better than mine. Like, um, but it's also been different than mine. Um, and, but that's, that's the adventure of it is like, my life is not my own. I wasn't created for me and just to fulfill my but own. Let me ask you this. Do you feel more like yourself than you did before? That's a, I think that's it. Like more, more me, more authentic. Like it's, and that's a big, I'm a millennial, right? So we love authenticity, but no, like that, I think that's the, the feeling It's not just, it's not just that like everything gets easier, but it gets more alive. Like it and gets well, more, well, it does it. I mean, it's like I used to think, oh, if I do that, then I'm going to be someone that I don't, I don't want to be, and I'm not going to like it. It's going to be boring and all this. But don't you feel like you're more like who you really are? Yeah. And don't you like being that way? Doesn't it feel great? I think that's it. Yeah. I remember Chris Stefanik said one time, like, um, and this is kind of funny. I mean, I don't mean Hold to Hold on. Let me get my here. notes. I'm going to take notes. Yeah. I don't Christopher like, Stefanik is quoted. But... I love Christopher Stefanik. Okay. Oh, I'm going to take notes. Yeah. I'm going to quote. I'm going to write this down. Yeah, he said, he, what did he say? He said, sometimes we have this idea that to become Catholic or like, you know, really go all in on God makes you weird. And he said, but if you've ever met anyone that's weird and Catholic, they were weird before they were Catholic. So <laughs> it's kind of terrible. But that, I mean, that's so like, it, it makes a good point. Like Jesus came to make you more of who you are. And I've definitely found that to be true. Like anything that was authentically Tim has just become more so in God. Um, and, and a lot of the it's ways like that I was hiding. Tim, like you plugged in Tim into the source. Like plug it in a lamp. The lamp looked nice, but there's no light coming out. And then you plug it in. Oh, now I see why that lamp is. So we're talking with Tim Glombowski. Are you going to tell us how they can find you, Tim? Yeah, L-A-L-T-O Catholic.com. That's our website, Lalto Catholic.com. And if they go there, they can they can have you come and speak to their parish. Work. You also consult with parishes. Speak, and uh, you're just just people, you're booked constantly to speak. Yeah, it's all, been busy the last place. couple of so years, for get, sure. Yeah, you, Go to his website. What is it again? Uh, L A L T O Catholic.com and book him to come to your church or to your men's group or whatever you want to do a confirmation classes. I think too. Um, just so much. Yeah. I like it all youth, young adult, uh, parish missions. We do a lot of, um, a lot of different stuff. So, well, we're talking with Tim Klimbowski. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure. We'll be back with more in just a couple minutes.
Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We're uh, talking today with Tim Glimbowski, who's a prolific speaker and he's a consultant to parishes. He's a he's a graduate of Steubenville University and lives with his wife. Is your wife's name Magdalene or Madeline? I forget. Uh, Magdalene, yeah, with Maggie. Yes. Maggie, what a great name uh, uh, in Denver, Colorado. We want to invite everybody. Uh, feel free to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and there's a place there where you can contact me. I've been so uh, so jam packed in the last two years, filming and and editing and producing Long Ride Home that I've had to say no to a lot of speaking engagements. But we're on the other end of that curve now, so I'm opening up the barn doors. Uh, so anybody who would like for us to come and speak to a men's conference or legatus or anything like that, you can go to our website deepadventure.com, and we'll get we'll get the ball rolling to come and be with your group. And uh, Tim Klebowski, who's our who's with us today as our co-adventure guide uh he is also he's a prolific speaker how many how many talks do you think you've given in your lifetime in your young your young lifetime so far yeah so i've been speaking for about 10 years um i don't know maybe a, uh i know we did we did about 100 last year wow um or in 2018 in 2018 we did about 100 i kind of wow. at the end of the year and i don't know so far in 2019 but yeah that, that's kind of really what god put in my heart when i was in a cc when i was studying abroad um, I, they do this thing where you flip in front of the San Damiana cross to hear the Lord speaking to you. And, uh, I got like three different verses and all of them were about preaching the gospels, like the, the voice of one crying in the desert. And, I, and then I got that verse again from, you know, Matt, Mark's oh, gospel. And I Luke's love gospel. that. No, and, dude, I live that. Yeah. 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 So I, that's just been an important part of what I feel like God has put on my heart to do. Yeah. That's what we feel too. It's that, 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 that scripture verse means a lot to us. The voice crying out in the wilderness. You know, we need, it, the, the Bible proclaimed that, that, that Elijah would come before Jesus came the first time, and the spirit and power of Elijah was in John the Baptist. We need a lot of John the Baptist now, too, before Jesus comes again. But uh, Tim, we, let, let, let's, take, let's take back, and by the way, we are going to, we are going to, at the end of this radio show, uh, we're going to end it, and then we're going to start it for five more minutes, and we'll do an extended version for our, for our Patreon oh, great. listeners. Uh, so if you want to be part of that crew, you got to go to deepadventure.com to do that. You get early access to the radio shows, TV shows, and the extended versions of, of the radio show, too. Ex- extended elements of it anyway. So, Tim, we were talking about happiness. Yeah. The pursuit of happiness. Um, and why that's built into the very core of every human being to seek that. How, would you, how did Aristotle, how, would, how did he define it? How did Aquinas define it? How would you define it? So they both do something kind of interesting. So just to get in, I, I think I feel like I can break this down in a way that's not going to bore anyone. I, I promise. But they, what, what they do first, which is kind of interesting, is they actually go through all the things that it seems like people associate as happiness. Because they said whatever it has to be, it needs to be the thing that when we have the possession of that, like nothing else is needed. Like it can't be, you know. So so they say, what it what does it seem like people like pursue or chase that seems to be like the thing around everything else that their life kind of revolves. So it's, is it pleasure? You know, well, no, like pleasure kind of goes away after a while, right? Can't be pleasure. Is it power? You know, it seems like a lot of people want to just be in control, in charge, like to, to have nobody ever be able to say no to them. It's like, well, no, it can't be that. Have you ever met a unhappy politician, right? You know, um, or is it is it honor uh, to, to be thought well of, you know, fame? That's that's a huge one, right? In our Instagram culture, like to be famous is a, is a really big one. Is that, well, there's tons of unhappy famous people, right? Or is it money? So many people seem to think if I just had enough wealth or if I just had that new possession, like then I'd be happy. Well, it never works that way, right? So they're, they go through all these things and, and first say what it isn't. And then finally comes down to, that seems to be one thing like that, that really brings lasting happiness. And Aristotle, 300, you know, 50 years before Jesus um, says, it seems to be a life of virtue and contemplation which leads to this excellence of soul. Like the reason he's saying that is not just because like doing good things is, you know, enough, but it actually seems that virtue shapes our soul and makes us into the kind of thing that is happy. Like happiness is almost a state of being uh, more than it is just a, like something that we obtain from the outside. And so Aquinas is just like, well, that seems super Christian, super Catholic, right? So he just kind of adopts that and elevates it saying the life of grace you know, actually um, making us holy and divinizing us. Like the saints are the happiest people. Look at John Paul, like the, Mother Teresa. It's one of the tests for saints. One of the tests for being yeah. saints is did they have joy? Well, you know, so, and then, but, you know, but St. Paul said, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And why don't I do the things I, I, I ought to do in, in this kind of pursuit of virtue, the, the classic virtues of justice, self-mastery, fortitude, and prudence? 
Yeah. Um, but he had the solution. Faith, hope, and love, the three theological yeah. virtues. And those, so the pursuit of those seven virtues. But you know what? Aristotle, you know, his pedigree back to Plato, back to Socrates. I love what Socrates said when he said that no harm can come to a virtuous man. Yeah. What did he mean by that? Yeah, I think that's the whole idea is that um, basically what they're talking about, like the one thing necessary, like the one thing to be pursued above all things. Like, And, and that's what I think is it powerful about examples like that is that they came to those realizations on their own just by like examining human nature. Like John Paul II said in Redemptor Hominis, man is the pathway of the church, meaning like God has built into our nature these concepts. Like we, we can actually just look at human experience and say, what makes this work? What makes it tick? And what makes it achieve happiness? Um, and when you have that, yeah, that, then you have everything else. Look at the saints, right? They, they, Maximilian Colby has virtue, needs nothing else, is willing to lay down his life for the for the other, um, you know, man in the the concentration camp who who cried out saying um, when he was, you know, going to be executed. Like there isn't, you're you're bulletproof when you when you have, when you live that life of of self gift of perfect love of God and love of neighbor. You need nothing else. Yeah, Socrates was about to. That was those were his last words. Mm. Just before he uh, was to drink, to uh, consume the, the, that special tea they like to make over there in Greece, hemlock tea. Hemlock, that was yeah, it. Yeah, and, yeah. But, he, but no harm did come to his soul. Right. You know, maybe right. his body for a season, but, you know. The early, the early church fathers, a lot of them referred to those guys as saints. You know, I think yeah. it was that special uh, revelation uh, to, to, through the children of Israel, through he, the Hebrew, but there was also the special infusion of ra- rationality uh, to the Greeks, just just the neighbors of the Hebrews, basically, and those two, the, the the those two coming together, the the ability to think and reason, as you are have a philosophy degree, and the and the the, the ability to to search out revelation and bring not 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 to intersect the two, like there's an intersection of of two discs of a Venn diagram, but it's a total integration. Yeah. But you know, isn't Jesus? Didn't Jesus say, "I am the way, the truth." in the life isn't isn't he truth so you know father robert spitzer talks about the soul's upward yearning hey, i love you know, those like the, the quartet that he did those are so good oh yeah i know there's yeah. a fifth one, one of them is, this, is there oh cool yeah on warfare for spiritual warfare but you know i was with him and we you know i have these 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 uh cigar samplers do you smoke cigars oh of course well i have these uh, seven virtue cigars uh samplers there's a oh, different cool. bl- there's a different blend for each virtue and yeah. they're, they're really good cigars and the label has a different virtue for you know eat like like uh, caritas for love, and then you but you unpeel this beautiful picture of the Renaissance painting of that virtue, the woman that represents that. But it's such a big label that you have to unpeel it in order to enjoy the cigar. And then there's a quote from one of my books on that particular virtue. But so I'm. Wait, I'm do you the, sell these? I would yeah, buy they're, on my, they're on my web store. David, oh, cool. Even your web store, and they're awesome. People can buy them. But but you know they're the, my biggest. I sell more of those than I sell books. Yeah, like that. that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's you know, cool. it's something manly yeah. about a cigar and a shot of whiskey. You know what I mean? That yeah. separates the, it's like, it's a solitude maker when you smoke a cigar. Women run on the beach in Waikiki at night. I light up a cigar and no one's going to come sit near me. I can read my Augustine and my Aquinas or whatever I am on my iPad after sunset. It's just a great solitude maker. And I could guarantee you my prayer life. And my st- study life and my writing of books is 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 all based on the the land, how long of a cigar I'm having that day. But anyway, yeah. I, I digress. But you know, I was with Father Robert Spitzer at the Napa Institute a couple of years ago, and I said, "Oh man, I love your book." And he started quizzing me on it, you know. But you remember that uh, the the upward yearning uh, of the soul, the five desires. I think it's for truth, for justice, for um, for unconditional love, and then yeah. the two that I think are so unique. Uh, is the desire to go home, which would be heaven, but and there's that fifth desire for beauty, which really, uh, if you, you, it may not be an empirical proof, but what else can you, you know, how different uh, the soul of a human being is, a spiritual, rational soul than the soul of an animal. Hey, Tim, we're wrapping it up. Please lead someone right now that wants to know the Lord in a personal way and wants to, to uh, surrender to him. Can you lead them in a prayer right now, and then we'll, we got to go. Yeah, let's do it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, as you, if anyone wants to just pray with me, just pray along um, together, just a simple prayer of just commitment to Jesus. We want to know you and um, we're sorry for the ways that uh, our lives have not reflected the joy that you want to place in our hearts and in our existence. And we repent um, and turn back to you and ask you for light, send out the light of your Holy Spirit into our hearts, into our lives. Give us something new, Lord, and different. Show us a new way and a new path. And in a particular way through the intercession of the, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, 
uh, the Blessed Mother. May we be led back into the fullness of your grace in the midst of uh, your Catholic Church and, and avail ourselves of everything that you want to pour out into our lives, the fullness of what you've come to do in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, just bless all those listeners and make it real to make yourself known to them. You know, Paul said that you that you have uh, that you know God, and then he changed. He said he said rather that you are known to Him. Don't be among those that Jesus talked about who uh, will come before the Father and, and say, uh, "Lord, Lord, I did all these great things in Your name." And God says, "Away from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you." It's not how all the great things you do for God. It's do you know God? Do you spend time with Him and have a personal walk with Him? Tim Glombowski, how can they find you again? Uh, L-A-L-T-O Catholic.com, L-A-L-T-O Catholic.com, or my personal website is Tim Glomkowski.com, but that's a, I have a long last name. So. I'm going to be really upset if people don't contact you. I'm going to look really bad if they don't write to you and tell you to, to come speak <laughs> to them. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. After we say goodbye to you, Tim and I are going to uh, record about a five-minute extended segment. I think we're going to ask him what his sins were he confessed at his uh, last confession. Something like that. We don't know. But we'll be right back uh, uh, next week with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to our website, deepadventure.com, and subscribe to our newsletter so you can get the video version of the show. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com. 